Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Infrastructure Partnerships Australia and its Chief Executive Brendan Lyon, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Water Symposium. In opening today's proceedings, I wish to first acknowledge and thank our sponsors to our event host, Clara Cutterjar, Clara, and our event sponsor, the Chair of IPA's Water Task Force, Francois Gauss from Trilogy. Thank you both for your support for this important event. Colleagues, on your behalf, can I also acknowledge a range of special guests who join us today. A particular warm welcome to our opening key sp keynote speaker, Johnson Cox, Chair of UK's Water Services Regulation Authority. Johnson, thanks for taking the time to speak with Australia's infrastructure sector today. In many respects, the authority you lead is a pioneer on regulatory reform, so your observations today will be highly valued by attendees. To Phil Davies, Chief Executive of Infrastructure Australia, and to Michael Karapit, a member of Infrastructure Australia's board and foundation member of IPA's advisory board, and someone widely acknowledged as a foundation father of Australia's modern private infrastructure market. And to Dr Tom Parry, a former and inaugural chairman of the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal here in New South Wales, and distinguished public servant. Thank you each for your contribution to the sector and your attendance here today. Can I also acknowledge our industry partners, to Stuart Wilson, Deputy Executive Director of the Water Services Association of Australia, and to Jonathan McKeon, Chief Executive of, Aus of the Australian Water Association. Thank you both for your ongoing engagement with IPA and water policy. Friends, at last year's symposium, we heard from a range of speakers about the case for a new and sustained program of reform in urban water. In particular, we heard that while Australia's water sector is performing well and is for the most part well regulated, it remains constrained by a lack of competition, inconsistent government arrangements, and an absence of price signals to efficiently regulate demand or to signal for efficient investment. This sentiment was subsequently explored in a joint IPA WASA report, doing the important, as well as the urgent, released by the Commonwealth Treasurer in Canberra last year. That report called for a new national process to reform the governance, regulation and market frameworks for urban water. Infrastructure Australia's 15-year plan, released earlier this year, made a similar recommendation. In some respects, IPA's plan, uh, IA's plan went further calling on governments to define a pathway to transfer state-owned water utility businesses to private ownership. Together, these report reports further evidence the case for change that's been begun to articulate a path, toward, a path forward for our policy makers. But if we are to honestly take stock of the debate since we gathered here a year ago, we could only conclude that the task of refocusing governments onto water reform has become harder, not easier. A year on from the release of the Harper Competition Report and we still lack clarity on the government's plan for moving from words to action on microeconomic reform in sectors such as ours. The recent election, which has seen the emergence of an even more fractured Senate, raises further questions about the Commonwealth's capacity to lead states to water and to make them drink. Of course, this challenging outlook does not apply to urban water alone. In fact, it applies across a number of infrastructure sectors. But in the case of water, the challenge is even uh, arguably more pronounced. For one, the burning platform of change is less prevalent in the eyes of the consumers, at least when compared with the everyday issues of road congestion, rising electricity bills and hospital wait lists. Though, of course, we know economically the opportunities for water and waste are significant. There also exists a pervasive view in Australia that water is unique and that these unique characteristics necessitate a limited reform approach. Though again we know from overseas experience that this is not the case, something Johnson Cox has experienced firsthand. Friends, I'm being frank in my outlook for reform, not simply to bemoan a lack of political will. Rather, I'm being frank because this outlook serves to reinforce the importance of events such as this, where we can come together public and private alike, to build the case and refine the pathway for change. Indeed, my message today is that the near-term political outlook does not lessen our task 
and we should not lessen our resolve. Why? Because the reform pendulum will swing. It's just a matter of when. We know that our governments are facing mounting and largely unmet requirements for broader capital investment. And we know that this is driving them to look at how they can cash out their chips from well-regulated -regula assets such as water. Indeed, Infrastructure Australia has valued publicly owned water assets across Australia at over $190 billion in gross terms, an unrivalled opportunity to recycle capital and drive innovation, and one that will, has, will not have escaped the notice of state treasuries. We also know that Australia's future standard of living is reliant on increased productivity, and that water, alongside transport, remains the least reformed of all of Australia's infrastructure sectors, making it a very logical candidate to be amongst the first cabs off the rank under a future economic reform program. As a sector, our task is to ensure that this fiscal and economic push is preceded by a pull factor of, res of resolving the right structures and incentives to govern water under public and private operation. Our joint IPA WASA research paper was the first shot across the bow, outlining how Australia can increase efficiency under public operation while offering the additional benefit of ensuring that when jurisdictions are ready to tackle privatisation of water assets, they are doing so within a framework of sound economic regulation. Today's event provides an opportunity to build on that report. Specifically, it provides an opportunity to continue to build consensus on the way forward and to ensure that urban water remains a part of the national economic conversation. In this regard, I'm buoyed by the depth of international and Australian experience that we have here in this room today. And I thank our speakers and panellists in advance for their various contributions across today's proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to welcome Stuart Wilson, Deputy Executive Director at the Water Services Association of Australia to introduce our opening keynote speaker. As I mentioned, IPA and WASA have worked very closely over this past year and we're very proud of that close relationship. Stuart, thanks for the role you've played in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stuart Wilson. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, some people have said to me that WASA and IPA, uh, IPA are not a natural collaboration. I, I don't know about that. <clears throat> what I can say is it has been a very easy collaboration with Brendan, Jonathan and Rob. And we are proud of the work that we have done together on reform in the industry, hard though reform is. At heart, IPA, WASA and the Australian Water Association are interested in ensuring that customers in the community get the best value for their sizeable investment in infrastructure. And as Adrian said, we have uh, between 150 and 190 billion invested in water and wastewater infrastructure in Australia. Our collaboration is part of the water industry looking outwards, not looking inwards, but looking outwards. The greatest change is that we are working with our customers to understand their values and preferences rather than assuming we engineers and economists know what is good for them. Looking outwards means that WASA as an organisation has opened its doors to private membership on a much more equal footing with public utility members and that will increase over time. Policy questions on ownership, for us, we leave to our government shareholders but we are keen to engage on the reforms that are necessary to ensure that customers benefit in the long term should governments go down that path. Looking outwards also means looking beyond our traditional delivery of water and wastewater to how what we do affects the amenity and livability of our cities. Where would Sydney have been today if we had continued to deposit raw sewage onto our city's beaches? And looking outwards also means that we look to the best ideas in the rest of the world. And the regulatory developments in the UK are simply essential to follow for anyone interested in water reform. So it has been a great pleasure and something of a coup to bring Johnson Cox to Australia. On Thursday, we spent the day with our utility managing directors and their chairs discussing reform. On Friday, we brought together economic regulators and regulatory managers. I think on Saturday we allowed Johnson time to see the Blue Mountains, although our, our transport system derailed that to some extent. So it is fitting that we are now open the conversation to this wider infrastructure group. 
Johnson was first appointed as chairman of Ofwat in September 2012 and reappointed at the end of last year until October 2020. Prior to that, he was a CEO for over six years at Anglian Water. And I will list just some of his other interests. Johnson is also a member of the Advisory Council for I Squared Capital, a $3 billion infrastructure fund investing globally in mid-sized commercial infrastructure opportunities in energy, waste and transport. He also ha holds chairman roles at Haworth Group and the Corey Group. The Corey Group owns London Waste Infrastructure Riverside, the UK's largest waste to energy plant and a collection of other UK businesses. So please join me with me in welcoming Johnson to provide the keynote address. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you to Stuart, uh, thank you to Peter, and thank you to Craig, our host in this event, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to get straight into it. It's four years ago today I stood, went in front of Parliamentary Selection Committee to be interviewed for a role I never imagined in my wildest, most absurd thoughts I would ever take, and it's been about three and a half years that I've been doing this role. Um, if you have my slides, I've changed them overnight to try and make them more concise, uh, and they will come out. And in the interest of time and getting questions today, I will skip a few slides. Um, it's a personal speech. I focus, you've all heard a lot about the UK's regime, so I'm not going to describe that to you in great detail. I thought of greatest interest to you would be to say, what have I learned over the last two years from doing this role? What are the things that makes economic regulation of water successful? And I'm going to look forward as to what we're doing in the next few years. So if I can go to some slides. Uh, that, uh, some of them I'll leave you to read in the pack, and that one that describes our role will be very familiar to many. This is, I think, my key summary for you of the messages I'd like to develop during my 20 minutes of speaking. There are very few jurisdictions around the world that have allowed private ownership of water assets. It was enabled in England and Wales by sort of accident. We had water corporations that were separate state corporations, and we had well-establishing billing systems and therefore revenue streams. That's what enabled Mrs. Thatcher to bring about a privatization. There have been service, environmental, and operating improvements that have been very significant, but I wouldn't be as arrogant as to say they're any more significant than have been achieved under public ownership in countries like this. I'm, I learn things from coming here and talking to colleagues in the Australian industry. I think the biggest benefit of not being in state ownership has been consistent access to capital markets and efficient balance sheets. But it isn't all perfect. 20 years of 25 years of declining bond rates and companies adopting increasingly high leverage beyond what the regulator assumes have made for very significant outperformance for investors. That may seem a good thing to some, but taken too far, this threatens the trust and confidence that's needed for customers who have had to pay a 40% increase in their bills over the period. Um, that's in real terms. And that can threaten their trust and confidence in this. Tough and independent regulation, fair as well, may not always be welcome to investors, but it has contributed to stability and it's brought the system back in line at various points. I think in the long run it's contributed to investor confidence. Periods where customers perceive the balance to be unfairly struck risk political intervention. However independent a regulator is, there will be political intervention if the system is not seen to be working for customers. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Regulators are evolving. Our regime could have been seen. I've seen the memoranda on which many Australian, small Australian pension funds came into the UK water investment. And I see regulation described in formulaic manner. Well, we're moving on. We're getting leaner, smarter, and we are moving to be less intrusive and less formulaic by relying on companies and their boards to step up and to own the outcomes for customers. I'll demonstrate that to you. And we're linking outcomes to equity returns in a more direct way than we've ever done before. 
a key point I hope you will take from this is that asking customers to pay for the sort of improvements that we've asked them to pay for requires their trust and confidence. And we all know that reputations are hard won and easily lost. If there's nothing else, those were my key messages, and I'll come back to them at the end. Those of you familiar with regulation will know almost everything on this slide. It describes our RPI minus X model. Uh, it, def it defines a model which worked for a good 20-year period in driving productive efficiency. But it's run its course. That productive efficiency halves. The scope for it halves every five-year period. We've been challenged by investment models that leverage and securitize the assets beyond what we assume. That brings risk that we worry about. We found opportunities to get more into how management think about spending money, more towards cash and less to, towards these silos of operating expenditure, OPEX and CAPEX. And I think the most important underlying thing underlying this is socioeconomic change. And we're about to embark on another period of it in the UK for reasons you will all be aware of. Um, really brings on the need for change. I came into this role at the end of 2012, November 2012, when regulator and investors had reached a meltdown. And investors had reached for the government. Affordability was a very major issue after the G GFC, as you call it here. Three years of inflation, a cumulative 15%. Customer incomes down by between 10 and 20% you can see a widening wedge there that at some stage was going to provoke unrest. It was the energy sector that started to provoke the unrest to start with, with bills rising very significantly. But water bills were linked to RPI, and the public distrust of utility sectors was rising. It coincided with a world you'll be very familiar with, of public distrust of corporate practices, such as tax avoidance, and I emphasize the word uh, avo tax avoidance is legal, and I'm not here making a statement about, about tax. It's just what the public perceive. Offshore ownership and anything that smacks of a lack of transparency. We had seen a period between 2006 and 2010 where our largely public listed sector, as it was privatized, went into ownership that was institutional, much happened to be foreign, but that's not significant. But it was accompanied by ownership in offshore jurisdictions and the perception of tax avoidance. And I emphasize again, that's lawful but not trusted. We, our review in 2009, because of the GFC, had been benign. And what was a very predictable sector with high confidence was threatened in the loss of... Uh, legitimacy. My wider thoughts on that are in a document that's on our website. I called it rather naively observations on the regulation of the water sector. Um, it was my way of starting to change the strategy. Uh, it was christened boulders in the pond by others. Um, and it developed six themes um, as to where I thought we needed to change. I'm not going to, in, in the interest of time, go through those. I will highlight a couple. couple. The first one was the need to really get back to thinking harder about customers. There was almost a sort of naive view that it was the, for the regulator to set what customers wanted, and that became the, co the regulatory contract with companies. That may have worked in early days. It no longer was relevant. And we, one of the things we did was to set up customer challenge groups, which were there to challenge companies through the setting on a five-yearly basis of the price review on what the, what the companies were delivering. There was a lot for those who were interested in on our website about it. It had some distinct benefits. It had a few drawbacks, which are learning points for taking it further, and we are taking it further going forward. Overall, it was a very beneficial move to get companies to be talking direct to their customers and taking ownership of customer outcomes. And I would emphasize the really big change, which some made and some have not yet made, was to talk to customers before they formulated their plans. The old way of working was to formulate the plans and then put them to the customer challenge group, maybe with this option or that option, but with a preconception of what the outcome would be. 
And the world's gone beyond that. This starts now with talk to the customer before you start putting your plans together. And I'm pleased it's been welcomed in our sector. Uh, one of the awkward and challenging things that regulators do, um, and we relearned this information, we had scrapped in 2008, 2008, collecting all information on companies. We used to be a veritable mine of information on the water sector. In the interest of less intrusive regulation, we scrapped it. But we forgot the power of publishing data. And we have moved to a world now where we won't publish very much, but we enable the publication of a lot of data. This chart makes any investor in the sector wince. And I've won no friends for publishing this in 2013, and it's been updated since. But it's a very stark reminder of the importance of legitimacy. What this shows you, you don't need to read the detail, the acronyms along the bottom are company names, the big 10 companies. It shows you dividends paid from the entities we regulate as a proportion of their regulated equity. Now, as we all know, the ret total shareholder return is made up of growth in capital value and cash return as dividend. This is merely dividends. It doesn't count. The best proxy for the growth in capital value would be the growth in regulated equity. I haven't put that on this. And you can see we were in a period, 2010 to 2012, high inflation, declining debt rates, lower than assumed, it's very good for the water investment model. And you can see we had companies here consistently in the high teens in dividend payout. We had some which, if extended over five years, would recover their regulated equity in five years. That is clearly a socially unsustainable model. And that was really the result of a price review set in times of trouble, coupled with macro factors, and that something had to be done. I'm delighted to say that we learned we remind ourselves that publishing information is a fantastic thing to do. It makes people feel uncomfortable. They don't kind of look it. They have a shout at me. And then they think maybe we've got to do something about this. And you will see the rate started to come down. The other area that's been challenging, so I'm giving you, because you all know most of the merits of our sector, I'm giving you the challenges we've had to navigate in the last few years. The other challenge we've had to navigate is structures. Now. On the left-hand side, you have the very typical public-listed company as privatised. A holding company listed on the stock exchange and a regulated utility with a licence and a regulatory ring fence around it that's emerged, which we regulated. We got into the position, we can debate whether we should have allowed it or not, where the assets went, the companies were taken private and complex structures emerged. Now, I've picked one to show you, but I would emphasize I'm not picking on that particular company. It was actually my team put this one in. This is Thames Water, but this could be one of six companies. And I know there are representatives in the room from some of the other companies of whom I could put up a very similar structure. And the company that is, I'm a customer of Thames Water, and as a customer, that little blue box, that sliver down here, is with the company I know as Thames Water. Above that is a plethora of financing companies. The point I'm making about this is what do you think customers think about that, world, that in a world of transparency, a world where they don't trust corporates very much and they certainly don't trust anything that smacks of looking like it's offshore and possibly for perfectly legal tax reasons. As I say, I, I can't remember which jurisdictions those companies are in, but if you looked across the mass of them, you will find the Cayman Islands, the Channel Islands, Luxembourg. That doesn't look good to customers in a world of austerity. If we were reliving the past, I don't think we'd allow that. And I think it's a real challenge going forward. So it's one of the things we've had to think about very hard. And it's one of the things our Treasury thinks very hard about in terms of risks and fragility of corporate structures. We wanted to remain a, or become even, a less intrusive regulator. It sounds great. It sounds like something you should try and do. But of course, as my affordability example showed you, it's great to be less intrusive till someone says you've become a toothless regulator. So one of our protections against that is putting things back to companies. 
I've been on the board of five, six public listed companies in my career, all in the infrastructure sector, and I've seen really good boards, and I've seen absolutely terrible experiences. And I believe that a board makes a real difference, and the leadership provided by the chair, the non-execs, to the management team is absolutely fundamental to, to corporate behavior and corporate success. So we happily had in our licenses a little provision that had been put in by my predecessor in the 90s to require compliance with the UK Corporate Governance Code. It was barely observed. We set out, as, again trying to be less intrusive, we set out a set of principles for board leadership and governance, to get boards to really step up. We invited each board to prepare its own code that complied with the five key principles. We invited them to do the same for their holding companies at a less intrusive level. And we have seen marked change and marked improvement in the um, way companies' boards have stepped up and taken leadership of the agenda and taken leadership of thinking about customers, thinking about outcomes, as well as thinking about financial returns. And it's a credit that that has happened. We remain concerned about financial resilience for the structural reasons I showed you. And again, we have required boards to now give us viability assessments on a much longer term basis than the standard one year, which we used to ask for, uh, and indeed, U developments in UK corporate governance support us in that. We also undertake pre-appointment interviews. Please do not regard that as the word vetting, it's not, but pre-appointment interviews with non-executives to again make sure they understand a vital public service provided under monopoly relies on good and effective boards. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the 2014 price review, and those of you who follow this will know these key themes, and I've talked about the way we've reformed our process, the customer-led focus, our reliance on boards. One of the fundamental things we've done is to require every board member and the board as a whole to sign off on every document. It's been fantastic, and it's going to go further. Um, I want to just pick up two things. Uh, one is the fast-track process. We created incentives for fast-tracking, and... We put a little bit of money on it, but much more we put reputation on it. It has been fantastic. Two companies got fast-tracked. No one would have predicted that those were the companies that were going to get fast-tracked. I've run two companies. I've taken them from the bottom of the pack to the top of the pack, happily. But I know just how hard that is. And we want to create a sector that's more dynamic, where those who aren't performing so well, new management can grab take hold of and say, I can get that to the top. And the part, our fast tracking is part of enabling that. And it's fascinating that the two companies who got the fast track were two outsiders for it. They weren't those that might have thought they were in place. That's disruptive markets. That's replicating what happens in competitive markets. We were very concerned that with the massive scope for financial outperformance, bear in mind that financing costs run to about 40% of the cost of the customer's bill. Companies, and with the structural changes that happened, companies had lost sight of that, what I call the promise of privatization. That promise to the customer, who's not interested in the balance sheet and the financing, even if that is the biggest driver of the bills, but is interesting in what are you doing for outcomes, for, for service improvement, for operating improvement, for responsiveness to me as a customer. So we started to put some more money back on that. We introduce something called outcome delivery incentives. Each company proposes its own with its customer group. In future, I think we'll have some core cool ones. This was the first time of doing it. Uh, I've just grouped three of the ones that are most common, and you can see some quite big sums of money on them. Look at this chart. Now, this needs a bit of explanation. Again, along the bottom are the 18 companies we uh, took through the price review. If you assume a return on equity in the 65 6.75% range as being the real terms equity ret return, your success or failure on our operating, uh, our, our outcome delivery incentives can, can change your return on regulated equity 
up to about 10%. If you're a highly leveraged company, it goes much further, but just as a result of that, but up to 10%, and it can drop it as low as 2%. That had some caps on it. We were willing to do this on an uncapped basis, but we wanted to see how it worked. I suspect next time it will be uncapped, or at least wider caps. It's the first step of getting a focus back to, in my terms, those promises of private, uh, privatization in the eyes of the customer. I'm looking with interest. By the end of this month, we will have the outcome for 18 companies for the first year of the, of the price review. I'd love to speak about something that's been done very successfully between ourselves, the government, and Thames Water which is the first model of directly procuring infrastructure outside of the established companies. The, I'll say very briefly, it's called the Thames Tideway. The Thames floods with sewage on as little as two millimetres of rain in London. That's clearly unacceptable. And whatever happens as a result of Brexit, we remain in breach of Europe, European legislation, and we will be fined, as the government will be fined, if we don't fix this. Four billion, four billion pounds sterling project. Two and a half, 2.7 billion of that has been put into a direct delivery vehicle uh, with leadership of Thames because they're the party best equipped because it has to integrate into their system, ourselves and government. We've created a direct infrastructure vehicle. It was our proposition. I inherited it. Well, I was nervous as hell about it because trying to take a construction project of a 30 kilometer long tunnel seven meters wide through underneath the river Thames does sound a bit scary um, it required a government support package which is I think pretty minimalist in the sense equity has to lose a lot of its value before that package can be invoked it's a disaster insurance we got that away with the lowest ever cost of capital the utility sector has seen 2.4% or seven percent real it's a fantastic achievement um, and sets a new model for the way we might finance big projects going into our next review every major project with ab above a hundred million capex uh, sorry to total expenditure companies will need to show how they have considered if not used considered direct procurement the fascinating thing to me was that construct the tunneling technology has got so good that the investor perception on the, of the risk on that is much reduced compared to what we expected. Very briefly then on looking forward, you've got a fairly good idea. I could portray to you, and in many ways I should, given the interest in privatization here, the arrow pointing to the left, you know, a great success. But the moment you rest on success, you become complacent. And the next stage to complacency is somebody gets upset. And we need to keep moving forward. There are challenges here. Uh, and I've talked about some of them. Getting back to the service focus, continuing to meet a water framework directive, which is in UK law largely. So that will survive, whatever happens politically. Um, greater resilience is a, bi is a big issue. And I think overall, without going through this whole list, maintaining customer trust. On the left on this chart, you have the point I made earlier, that productive efficiency, so for an economist, productive efficiencies, I would describe, as a non-economist, I would describe as those you can get out of the current system. Halve, or the current structure, halve every five years. That's what those bars are telling you. On the right-hand side, we have new challenges. Our population forecast to hit 70 million by 2030. I grew up in a country that had low 50s. So, you know, this is a big issue. And again, it's an issue regardless of whatever happens in the wider political world. Climate change, I barely need to say much about. Water scarcity, the water is scarcest in the southeast where most of the population growth is. Resilience has become a big issue. Barely... Well, I don't think we've had a winter for the last four years where we haven't had pretty catastrophic flooding somewhere with all records broken. And we're in a stage where that design standard of one in 30 years for infrastructure is out the window. Uh, government is debating standards of resilience of one in a 1,000. 
the large population centers. I don't know where we're going to settle this, but it's going to be a big issue. And I don't want to forget that word affordability there. I described to you a scenario I encountered when I first took up this job. High inflation, that's good for the finances of water companies. Lower bond rates than expected, good for financing infrastructure. Customer incomes plummeting. And what does that lead to? Social unrest. Well, I could portray a scenario for you today which worries the hell out of me, which is inflation going up on the back of our exchange rate going down. Uh, yesterday's papers were full of uh, speculation about bond rates. If you can think of bond rates coming, or uh, uh, central bank rates coming down from half a percent, coming down from there. And I could develop scenarios about economic recession in the UK that could be really quite worrying. As I emphasize, those are scenarios, they're not forecasts. It's a picture I worry about. How are we regulating going forward? This is the supply chain for water. You start with raw water, you go through getting it to the tap, you take it away as dirty water, you end up discharging clean water back to the river, and you end up with solids, solids being the biomass that's treated your wastewater, which you've concentrated. Uh, we politely call it bioresources here because we decided the word sludge wasn't very attractive. And the re importance of this is we are going into a period of complexity for the next five years in the interest of getting to a simpler world in the future. And I know that's not a great message, but we look to see what can we deregulate. We're going to separately regulate water resources so that other parties can bring new water into the system. We desperately need it. Only half of all abstraction licenses in the UK uh, belong to water companies. Why not let other people bring water in? Why not let other people build reservoirs if we need to, uh, like the Thames model, Thames Tideway model? Retail, we are already doing separately. For business retail from April 2017, business customers, it's about 20% of the revenues, all business customers from your corner shop to the very biggest will be able to choose their supplier. Uh, we will see how that works. And at the right-hand side, really interesting, bioresources, the sludge I talked about, 10% of the value chain. I was really, you know, I thought I knew the sector, but when that number came out, it made me sit up. That product, treated, pasteurized, he heated, uh, broken up, leads to gas generation and leads to a very useful fertilizer. This is stuff 25 years ago we used to stick into the North Sea. This is now a useful product that can be mined. And anaerobic digestion, the treatment method, is used for other things, food waste, green waste. We thought this could be deregulated. So we're separately price regulating this for the next five years on our way to complete deregulation of that market. Those are the principal changes in our model going into the next five years. The emphasis on customers gets stronger and stronger, and particularly the role we are giving customer challenge groups. Our greatest learning about the customer challenge groups was they didn't have enough information on which to really challenge the companies. And they didn't have comparative information. And were having abandoned all information, seen the power of publishing data sometimes, we're now requiring companies to publish data on a prescribed basis. So we don't do it. We don't want to carry you know, 50 people doing that. Publish the data, make it available, make sure it's on consistent comparative basis. I want to just underline the work we've done on vulnerable customers. I grew up in this industry with this idea that we had a sort of list of vulnerable customers. They were people who were on dialysis and needed more water. They were people who had on low incomes. They were people with large families in metered properties. And kind of the definition your customer service people had was there's a list of vulnerable customers to think about. We have redefined that in the last year, and it's been a real eye-opener. Because what we've discovered is that half of us, Half of us in this room, at some stage in our life, will be unable for some period to properly take care of our own interests or will be vulnerable socially. That can be unemployment, it can be illness, it can be bereavement. You get the, the point. It's a situational 
state, not a permanent state. And our customer service in a largely monopoly industry is not up to that. And that, for us, is a major area of change. And I'm pleased to say the companies are picking up the mantle and running with it. Very near the end. We have been asked by... Oh, this is a point for about legitimacy for those who invest in the UK water sector. Uh, probably the single biggest change we're making with the great, in terms of sort of impact it's had, is we are starting to decouple our inflation indexing from retail price inflation, an outdated index, no longer updated, statistically flawed, consistently overstating inflation by 100 basis points, and moving to consumer price inflation. I think I've spent more time discussing that in the last six months than anything else. Um, we are reviewing on behalf of government, at the request of government, we have a very pro-competition government, whether to allow household competition. So competition in the household market. I'm not going to go through this slide. If you're interested in it, I'm here at exactly the wrong time because on about Friday this week, certainly by Monday next week, we will have published our first draft findings on that, and I can't preempt them. I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to close with some very personal reflections on holding the water industry to account. It's a fantastic industry, and as you gather, I've had three periods of my life in it, two on one side of the table, one on another, and I love the industry. It's been a success, but not without challenges. Water companies are monopolies, and any of us who've trained anywhere in economics know that monopolies are prone to complacency and slow innovation. Our job is to be fair, to be tough-minded, and to be independent in holding the industry to account to deliver the promises of privatisation. Any complacency and periods where you see regulators anywhere of being complacent lead to worse outcomes in the long run. That independence is important to investors, but I do often have to sound the message to safeguard that independence. No independence is absolute. To safeguard it through the good times and the bad times. I've experienced in my tenure here Investors complained to government when I walked in, not to me, predated me, uh, about what the regulator was doing. You do that kind of thing at your peril. It's got to be a consistent, if you rely on an independent regulator, you, you sort of back the independent regulator. Sometimes it'll work in your favour, sometimes you may not like it. Legitimacy of the industry depends overall, I've talked about all those other challenges, it depends on customers seeing the operating, the service for performance, and I should mention environmental performance, is what they're expecting. And we need to constantly rebalance that against the increasing significance of financial performance. That's why we're widening the incentives of pushing the frontier. And we've done a little bit, as I showed you in my chart on equity returns. We are widening further going forward the incentives to be up at the frontier, versus those who stay in the middle or the lower part of the pack. And I'm delighted to say what we've done so far. I see, I'm, I think I'm seeing working. That's my point. Companies do respond. Incentives do matter. Reputation matters. But maintaining the legitimacy of the sector, customer trust, hard won, easily lost, remains for me the single most important thing that the regulator does. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Johnson. Look, ladies and gentlemen, Johnson has very generously offered to take questions from the floor. I'm sure that presentation has given us plenty of food for thought. Uh, opening up to the floor. Look, I might kick things off whilst people are gathering their thoughts. Um, Johnson, the, the trend towards decentralised infrastructure uh, is occurring here, uh, not just in, in water but in energy also. Um, how do you see that play out um, and, and, and how does a regulator uh, like off what balance, um, you know, ensuring economically efficient entry with, um, with, with, with harnessing, if you like, the innovations and the wider economic benefits that come with some of these decentralised schemes? Thank you, John. When I um, hear the words economically efficient entry, I'm always reminded I'm not an economist, although I did once do a degree in economics. Um, we have had our own experiments with this, particularly with allowing new inset appointments and new entrants to come and take, take areas from uh, existing incumbents. Um, it mixed. I've seen some fantastic examples 
of new entrants coming in um, and bringing whole new approach to service to customers, whole new approaches to tackling leakage, the thing customers the most care about. The thing that really inflames them is leakage. So fantastic work on that. And fantastic work in this particular example I'm thinking of, of putting in what here in Melbourne, not in Sydney, but in Melbourne, I know you talk of as the purple pipes, the sort of the second supply of water. Seeing that sort of innovation coming in, I think that's fantastic. I know everybody worries about cherry picking. Well, actually, I talk a lot to new entrants. They have, don't have any sense of cherry picking. They feel the barriers are so stacked against them. Developers, land developers who just want to get the project out of the door, and much as they hate all utilities, it's still easier to work with the incumbent than the new entrant. Um, so they don't, at the moment, perceive advantage. We know that when those new entrants build to a certain size, we will stop their pricing off the incumbent, and we will regulate them separately. But we're not going to do that till they hit a, a certain critical mass. Um, I see no evidence. But I think you've got a wider question, which is, you know, throughout the energy world, we're seeing decentralization. And we're going to have to think harder about that. I think our, what we're doing with bioresources is the beginning of creating a business. It would be fascinating to see what investors come into that renewable energy field. It's coming. Questions from the floor? Yeah, we have a right mic, just uh Sorry, while, while we're just waiting for the question. In our last review, one of the companies that got enhanced really grabbed us with taking their business back to community water companies, breaking it up notionally into sort of community companies. And I think that was part of the same thing of this sort of the world, the society wanting to get closer back to its providers. I don't know if it'll work, but it was a very interesting idea. Sorry, sir, I... No, no, you. thank you. Uh, Tom Parry, uh, a comment and a related question. Uh, I've been playing the regulatory game for a little over 24 years, like you on both sides of the table. First 12 years on the regulator's side of the table and the last 12 years on the regulated side of the table. Uh, when we started regulation, there were two broad paradigms that we looked at. Uh, the, the UK model, the little child, buy it, Michael Beasley model of incentive regulation or the North American rate-based regulation. And leaving aside the details of how those models were implemented and the way regulation took place, we were strong believers in incentive regulation, the UK model. Um, reading your, or looking at your slides and listening to your comments, you seem to believe that the scope for incentive regulation, the scope for efficiency improvements on the OPEX side, the CAPEX side, halves every five years mm. or so. I'm not sure that's right. Uh, it, it seems to be an outcome. My observation and now a question is that I'm not sure that incentive regulation is still being actually practised either in the UK or in Australia. Incentive regulation for me was all about leaving sufficient incentives on the table, both on the standard OPEX, CAPEX, but also on the financing so that the companies would have an incentive to pursue the most efficient delivery of outcomes, accepting standards are set in different ways, uh, so that customers would benefit with lags, but over time, and shareholders would also benefit, whether those shareholders were government or, or um, the equity market, private sector. So my question is, do you think incentive regulation is now dead and we just have a variant of rate base, in other words, build up the rate base and play the, the whack game with angels on pinheads. Uh, I take a different view. I think we are rekindling and reigniting incentive-based regulation. I think the old productive efficiency is dying for the reasons I said. That's why we're changing the structure of incentives. Um, what we have seen is that the incentive model as set up by our predecessors worked fantastically for operating incentives. The investor kept it all. You reclaimed it five years on. That is not seen as fair by customers when in an era of declining cost of financing over 25 years, we have as regulators consistently set over prudent to higher rates. And that, that model can't survive if it's not recapturing some of that for customers. Uh, if you look at the incentives in our regime, those incentives on service performance I showed you and the widening of those. The sharing model, which is now a 50-50 sharing model, 
It's more investor weighted for the companies that get our enhanced or fast track status. I'd say to you actually we're increasing the incentives. Uh, we're doing something I believe passionately, which is we are making life more difficult for those who don't perform or for mediocre performers. I think that's a necessary bit of incentive regulation and we're increasing the scope uh, for those who do really well. I'm sure we'll get it wrong. I'm sure we will have embarrassing examples of people who still outperform. That's the tough bit I've learned of being a regulator. You're inherently cautious. But I think we have rekindled incentive regulation. I've worked in the North American regime running a company, and I'd never want to go to rate-based regulation. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, at the back there. Johnson, thanks very much for a great speech. It was really quite interesting. Um, I've been involved in the, my name's Brian McGlynn, sorry. Uh, I've been involved in the sale of a number of assets for government and the overwhelming thrust of the legal documents uh, is that the buyers or the purchasers of the future owners want a stable regulatory arrangement and a fixed legal arrangement so that nothing changes for the next 50 years so they can maximise the amount they pay and maximise their return over time. Clearly from your presentation, that doesn't work for water or it doesn't work for most assets. Uh, in that the regulation becomes stale after a few years. So how do you reconcile this need to maximise the sale price and, and therefore stabilise the environment uh, with the need to com continuously change, update and increase the, the value of regulation over time? Well, I suppose fortunately for me, I've not been part of selling assets, except you might say the Thames Tideway, so I've not been concerned about maximising proceeds for selling. I'm concerned about maximising uh, stability, and good service for customers going forwards. I think our Thames Tideway example was fascinating. <coughs> we spent quite a lot of time going down that more traditional public-private partnership where you fix the return for a 30-year period. And what I found really interesting was it was investors, pension funds and the like, who chose to prefer our model of five-yearly regulation. For the construction period, they have a guaranteed uh, rate of return, which was that 2.47% whack. That was the distinguishing bid factor because both parties bid against the same <laughs> construction contracts defined with a consortium of contractors. And they opted to go for our five-yearly review as the preferred mechanism. I think that said an awful lot about the whatever huffing and puffing we get about changes we make, and we get plenty of it, it actually did say underneath all that, investors rec recognize that this is a stable regulatory regime. But stability does not mean no change, and it certainly doesn't mean one-sided. It means constantly, in my mind, being ahead, trying to make sure that you're keeping this sector going forward. Of course, making sure the investment flows, but also making sure that customers continue to think they've got a good deal. And everything I see says people are prepared they're prepared to invest in building a tunnel under the Thames at 2.47% whack. I think we're probably getting it right. We probably have time for one more question. Um, hopefully a quick one. Kate Beattie from Sydney Water. Um, I was really interested to hear you say that since privatisation um, of the water companies in the UK, customers' bills had gone up in real terms by about 40%. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you have a view on about how much of that might be due to circumstances that couldn't be changed and how much was uh, due to the companies basically doing the wrong thing by their customers. Oh, a very difficult one to answer. I can just throw out two numbers. So bills on average up 40%, real terms. Efficiencies have been 30% gains. Um, yeah, companies have undoubtedly become a lot more efficient. There's a lot further to go. I find it hard to go beyond that in answering your question, Kate. Um, I'll think a bit more and give you a better answer before I leave. Thank you. Johnson, on behalf of IPA and all attendees, can I thank you again for the depth of your presentation today? Uh, look, we took many things from your talk. Um, in particular, you know, for me, I think three things stood out. Uh, firstly, that reform, including ownership reform, is entirely possible and can be beneficial 
with the right regulatory settings, of course. Secondly, that reform or rather changes uh, do not have an end point. Rather, they're ongoing and evolving. And to quote you, uh, you know, the minute you rest on success, you get complacent. I think that's certainly registered. Uh, finally, and most importantly, uh, your emphasis on the critical importance of maintaining sector legitimacy and customer trust. As you observed, it is hard won and easily lost, something that should be front of mind here as we progress the case for change. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me again in thanking Johnson Cox.